ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to That Great Business Show. I am Conal O'Moran. This is episode 55, posting on the 1st of October, 2021. Wow, where did that year go? Coming up, another fab mix of businesses and business stories on what you, our listeners, like to call Ireland's best business podcast. First, though, the four ladies from Awaken Hub that we had on last week's episode 54, what we call the bonus issue, have been back on to say they got a huge reaction to the podcast. And I quote, their socials have fallen over. Whatever that means, it sounds sore. They had 150 registered for their launch event and they have received 80, 80 applicants for their She Generate program from across the country. That is across the island of Ireland. So they want to cover all 32 counties but need applicants now from Carlo and Cavan to get a full house. The She Generate Accelerator Light is open to both commercial businesses and social enterprises from any sector at either the idea or at the very early stage. Closing date is 5 p.m. Friday, 8th of October. So go for it. Listen back to episode episode 54 for more. Now, this week on episode 55, we have doctors who want hospitals to know the truth about patients, a commodity trader who wants dairy farmers to know the truth about milk prices. And did you know that Trinity College Dublin runs classes in Galway, Wexford and Athlone? Well, I didn't. And that's why I love that great business show. Every day is a school day when you listen to this podcast. And our good wishes to all at Lenisk after that dreadful fire. Ironically, only on last Sunday, Managing Director Vincent Cleary was in touch with me to say he'd join Team GBS on that great business show. And then... Just a few hours later, half the business was gone. The business community, including Team GBS, is right behind you, Vincent. If there's anything, anything, anything we can do, we're here. That's all coming up in the next hour. But as always, we acknowledge our wonderful sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, makers of the world's best shaving oil. Their support brings you the best business insights every week. So... Do the right thing. Back them by buying their product. Now that we're traveling again, their 25 ml bottle of all natural shaving oil is your ideal travel companion and shipping is free for orders over 20 euro. That great business show. Now, because of what I do, chatting to people on that great business show, I suppose I know a little about lots, but I can put my hands up now and say, I know. Sweet nothing about how the milk price is set for our dairy farmers. Does it fluctuate per day, per month, per year? And can you get locked into a supply contract that can actually cripple your business? Questions, questions, and we want answers. Co-founder of the Concept Dairy app, it's brand new, is Dermot McCulgan. But he isn't a dairy farmer either. In fact, he has a fab CV, having worked... In commodity trading with Ornua and with J.P. Morgan in London, uh, where he was a VP. Oh, and he also rode for Ireland. We might get on to that as well. But Dearman's app is aimed at dairy farmers because he'd like them to get the upper hand in negotiations. On love in Uchter, as we might say in Irish. Dearman McCulgain, welcome to that great business show. Thank you very much, Conal. Delighted to be here. Well, to fall to Let's start with the rowing. <laughs> when I was looking up your LinkedIn page, I saw, yeah, 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 you've got a great uh, CV. Then I said he won, uh, he rode for Ireland and won medals. What medals have you got? Uh, well, I have a, a few national championships for the All Ireland's, uh, and I have a silver medal from the World Cup in Lucerne. That's all right. And a bronze medal at the World Student Games, and one or two other ones here and there. That's all right. Well, you put in like a dog. You were <laughs> well trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that about you. In fact, when you started chatting to me, that's quite cool. Now I like uh, stuff like that. Did I ever row for a no? Did I ever do anything for a no? <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I envy people like you. Let's get into the serious business, though. How does, give me A to Z, how does the milk market work for Farmer Smith, no matter where he or she is? Very, very good question, Connell. Um, so start, you're a farmer and you produce all milks, all your milk and it's, it's September now. So you, you've been producing for the whole month and you'll only know what price you get for that milk on, until the ne- middle of the next month. 
So you were, you imagine going to work every day and not knowing what your salary is going to be until the following month. B-A-D, that's what I would call that bad. Yeah. Exactly. So we call it the milk price casino. Okay, I can see where you're going, yeah. So, and then the milk processor then it works very, very hard and they do such a great job collecting Irish milk and creating fantastic products to export globally. And it's only really at that point in time, once the invoices have been raised, that they can actually realise how much money they can pay their farmers. Now, sometimes they get surprises. They might have done a deal six months previously that is now losing money. And unfortunately, the person who has to pay for that is the farmer. So that's where our risk management platform comes in and helps the farmers. And what does it do? I mean, if what you're telling me, it sounds a bizarre way to run a business in arrears and no visibility. It's like the absolute don't do this in business lesson. Well, I, when, I, when I entered the dairy industry, I was quite shocked when I saw what was happening. But then I realized there is a solution for it. And hence, we established Concept Dairy to provide this risk management platform for the, for the milk processors. But more importantly, the free farmer app for the farmers where they can see how much their milk is worth into the future. That was the ad. So, <laughs> <laughs> well done. So, you are hoping that every, every dairy farmer here, Britain, maybe across Europe, into the States, will take this app up and use it. What will it mean to he or she? Well, what it will, they will have an independent reference price on what their milk, what their milk is worth. What does that mean? So what we do in the background, we combine the physical and the financial markets and look at the various different elements with makes up a milk price. So what we see on the shop, we look at it as milk on the shelves, but there's, you've got yogurts, you've got cheese, you have butter, you have whey powder that goes into sports nutrition. And then you have three different sectors, very different. So retail, the supermarket piece, food service, like your McDonald's, your Burger Kings, your various different other parts of them, that whole sector. And then you have the ingredients market. The ingredients market is really, really volatile. It's like the, the butter that goes into your biscuits, your cheese that goes into your pizzas, the mozzarella, all those different elements. So in the background, we have our AI and machine learning that go into formulating a milk price all the way back into, into an app that a farmer can see and say, that's how much my milk is worth for the next two years. Two years out. Yeah. If they decided we'll take a number that it's worth a euro a litre, I know it's nothing like that, but anyway, say a euro a litre, and can they lock that in? If they see it on your app, can they press a button and say, I'm yours, I'm in? Well, so what we need first, we need the milk processors to get our system internally. How many have you got? So at the moment, we're in negotiations with quite a few. Some are very, very interested, especially since we launched there two, three weeks ago. And it's, it's, it, that allows then the farmers to have the platform to execute because the milk processor will collect the milk as normal. But in the background, we need to help them manage the processors, manage the risk there's, because it's, it's a big education process as well. I can see that. Now, let us say there's a fabulous processor called Strathroy. Let's say that Strathroy has struck a deal somewhere. One of those deals that you said might be... Uh, Gone ex profit, let's put it nicely. <laughs> How can your AI know what that is worth or not worth or deals struck by the various uh, processors? So there's so there across the supply chain there's three three main actors. So you have the farmers on one side, you have the milk processor, and you have the customer. So the customer will have agreed a price with Strathroy for the for that milk, and then Strathroy can feed that back via our technology all the way back to the farmer. So the the milk processor will be able to lock in their own processing margin and then offer that price back to the farmer at, at any point in time when as soon as they strike the deal. I should have explained when you were saying that you're a commodity trader, you have a big, big, big background. First of all, you are an engineer by training. Yes. So maths is second nature to you. Third, you have spent many years, not that many, uh, in London trading oil, gas, what else? Electricity and environmental products. So that's where your head rests, because even prior to coming on air here, we were having a chat and you were working out margins in your head. The margin of me making a blooper, the margin (laughs) of me making a whole holy horlicks of it. (laughs) I just, I'm listening to you, and I have a bit of a background in that area. I'm not sure that it's going to be that easy. A sell. 
Yeah, it, 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 there is a large education element to it. And one of the reasons for moving from the energy sector into dairy was there's a huge opportunity in it as well. Um, the financial markets in Europe and dairy really only started in 2015. So I entered the, the dairy markets in 2016, the next year. And the, using physical... Is that post-quota? Post-quota, yes. Hey, you're not just looking at a pretty <laughs> face here. Exactly. I just worked that out now. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, and that's a huge point as well because post-quota, there were, all the restrictions on the Irish dairy volumes were lifted. So Irish dairy uh, milk production went up 60%. Whoa. So, so you have to imagine from a milk processor perspective, they have a wall of product coming at them and they have to sell it because it goes off if, it, if they don't. So there's huge pressure on them. So if you'd look, take a period of time between 2015 to 2018, butter was more volatile than Bitcoin, just to put it into perspective. Really? Yes. Okay. Well, that's now absolutely caught my attention. Let us say that you get Farmer Smith the aforementioned, he, she uh, adopts your, your app. What's the promise or the offer that you're making them to say, I'm going to make you 20% extra, I'm going to make you your life easier? What's the, the offer? The, the offer is price stability and financial security. Um, so there's an, the, we, we talk about sustainability and everyone talks about environmental sustainability and social sustainability, but nobody really addresses economic sustainability. So if a farmer has some visibility on what their milk price will be for the next two to three years, they can afford to embrace all the environmental initiatives. They can afford to hire more staff. And for them, so with those staff, the, the, the milk help, they can afford to then get mortgages, raise their families and help rural communities. So there's, there's, a, there's a massive knock-on effect to this. But another element that's really important that uh, is the mental health of, of farmers. And unfortunately, we have one farmer a week on average commits suicide. And that is an awful, awfully down to financial insecurity. So if we can help that in any way, I think we'll be doing a good job. So going back to the, um, say a, a farmer locks in for two or three years, there's always going to be somebody down the road who says, ah, you're daft. I'm getting tuppence or th- cents or how many more cents more per litre than you. Can the farmer who is on your system break a contract or what's the contract the system? Well, the contract is binding. It's like a normal contract. There, there are some... Physically written or do you press button A to say I'm in or... It, it, we, we try to digitalize it as much as we can because it makes it easier then for the whole confirmation process in the background. But farmers are very, very intelligent as I'm finding out and uh, and they get an awful lot of bad rap and farmers are, run, are highly, they run highly complex businesses. They're one. They're part-time vets, mechanics. They they're landscapers. They they do so many different different jobs. And if you imagine you had five people all doing those jobs for you, and you, they didn't know what salary they were going to get, well, you wouldn't have many people working for you. And that I can see that the, that side of the problem, the adoption of the phone. That's a given because yeah. everybody has a phone now. But then to start running your business off a phone, I love the idea. Yeah. Sounds fabulous. Yeah. What's that? You've obviously done some market. I hope you've done some market <laughs> research. What has been the the, the re- reaction from real farmers? They absolutely love what we're doing, and they can't. A lot of them, particularly because the prices are very, very high at the moment, historically high levels. They would really like to be at the lockout and at these at these points. And one of the one of the elements is is we help in the background. We help the milk processor lock it out physically, but then if there's no physical answer for them, we help them in the financial markets if they don't have a physical hedge at that far. All based in Dublin, are you? Yeah, but L- Dublin and London. Okay, but you do have world ambitions. Well, we do, yeah. We'll always, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, discuss. Well, we're, we're working with some uh, milk processors in the continent. Um, the European dairy market is the largest in the world, and we think it has got the largest opportunity, especially since quotas were lifted. The US market has a derivative market already, um, but the unfortunate thing is if you're a small farmer, uh, maybe 50 to 200 cows in the US, you're not going to have, potentially not going to have the cash flow and the margin to make margin calls in the financial markets. That's where our system is different. We face the farmers physically and not financially, and that is how they'll be able to use our system and work with their milk processor. How much does this system cost the farmer? The, the app is free for the farmer and they can download it whenever they want and they can look and see have visibility. 
We so that would be not unlike them looking at their bank account, for example. They can see live prices moving along and whatever. Then they see, say, it goes to whatever uh, fifty cent a liter. You say, yeah, well, I'll have that. I lock that in. Can I physically lock that in while I'm sitting watching the TV? Yeah. You should be able to sit down and then the order goes to your milk processor and then your milk processor verifies it and we collect a small margin when you lock in your milk price. And if I'm with processor A, can I switch to processor B? It really depends on the contractual nature of that. But in the UK, it's very different. People do switch processors quite often in the UK. What's often? Uh, maybe every six months sometimes, depending on what the prices are. If they've been paid a bad price for a long time, they are, they're more inclined to move. I'd say when you were in London, you knew absolutely everything about oil, gas, electricity and all. When did you start learning about um, banya, about milk? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was approached to uh, for, for the job in Dublin, I started to do my research into the market. When you say the job? A job, a job. A job. <laughs> a job. <laughs> and are you doing that job now or is this a side hustle? No, the, the, this, this is a full-time concept dairy. Um, we're bringing, bringing, bringing this tra- price transparency all the way without any, any political handcuffs. And you mentioned a we. Make sure, because there's a reason <laughs> for this. Who is the we of the we, Tonto? <laughs> well, well, the very important Jacqueline Fitzgerald. Who might she be? Uh, she is uh, the the subtle marketing genius behind what we're doing, and she distills stuff from my brain and puts it onto pieces of paper where people can actually God understand. God lover, I'd say <laughs> she is your co-founder, who also happens to be my partner as well. Correct. In crime. <laughs> She's uh, she is the owner of your three children, or the uh, yeah. So, business wise. Where is it at? Where, where, when will I see all the farmers saying I'm using Concept Dairy? Well, we are at a point in time now when par- farmers have experienced some very low prices back in the start of 2016 and we're coming out of, out of a coronavirus and we, hopefully we don't get another dose of volatility. But I think hopefully in the next uh, few weeks we will have a milk processor on board that will be able to offer the milk prices via, via our system direct to their farmers. That is very exciting. Like, if... I- I said from the very beginning, I know nothing at all about this area, but I'm learning fast. It sounds kind of revolutionary. Well, it, it is in a way. And what we're doing is bringing the, the, the learnings from other markets and yeah. then t- tweaking it to dairy. And then the, with, with technology and the way that everything's developed, it's so easy to put, give that trans- transparency to every farmer in their hand and for free. And that's, that's, that's the magic of it. And if they're paid in arrears... Well, you won't be paying them on the day or immediately or? No, not at the moment. We, but we are discussing stuff with some financial institutions that would, because because they are, will have more stable income, they will be able to leverage and b- borrow on the back of that because their income won't oh, be as volatile. see where you're going with that, all right, yeah? Yeah. Are there, and I think that you already answered this by saying that the uh, there is something similar in the States, are there competitors? Um, in different parts, so there are financial players, there, there are physical players, but there's nobody combining the physical and the financial markets and passing it all the way back to the farmer. Is, a, is anybody dealing with farmers on the physical side at the moment digitally? Not digitally, no. So are you ahead of the curve? Potentially. Potentially? You've done your research, <laughs> I hope. Well, we are. We are. Yeah. Well, we are. We, we'd like to think we are ahead of the curve. This could be very big. Potentially, that's where we. That's where we're going. <laughs> we're starting with dairy, and then hopefully going to other markets afterwards. Get away! What are you going to go into next? Uh, we're looking at seafood, beef, poultry. Um, once we have, because they farmers need to have that certainty of income as well, and and on the from the buyer side. So if you're a large supermarket chain, you want to know what your input costs are. If you're a, a large blue chip manufacturer and you're buying skim milk powder to go into your into your Mars bars or whatever, you want to know what your input costs are. Of course. So this hey, When you started off, you called yourself concept dairy and then you decided, you know, there's money and fish and, and beef and all. What are you going to do with that name? Well, we, <laughs> the, the, the main company is called Concept Commodities, but, we, ah, okay. but, yeah, but we're, uh, we're, we're working on some new marketing strategies in the future. So it should be interesting. Again, that's uh, uh, Jacqueline again, I presume. Exactly. <laughs> Funding. What about funding? So we are completely self-funded um, at the moment. We're and we've 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 managed to bootstrap it to date, uh, invested a lot of time and effort into it, and we're potentially looking to. And once we start to scale and get to a serious, we'll look to maybe look at some some funding, external funding. You'd need clever funding. With what we call clever money, would be very useful here. 
the kinds of people I'm thinking would be Dermot Desmond, J.P. McManus, those kinds of guys who actually understand markets, commodities and all? Yeah, it, it, you, it's a read all about having a value-added player. So, number one, it's the cash is good. You have to understand the volatility, market dynamics, but also be able to introduce us into customers. Like, for example, milk processors, various different uh, actors in, in this whole space. Who are the huge players in milk worldwide? So Lactalis in, in France are a massive company. Um, they do an awful lot all globally. And you have Nestle, huge, huge Yeah, we buyer. know them, of yeah, course. Yeah. Never heard of Lactalis, but yeah. there you go. Lactalis, you've got Danone as well. Yeah. Um, so like the there's a few then, the, the, the large min, mini dairies in China. Um, loads of companies all over the world. Okay, so what can Team GBS do for Concept Dairy? Well, potentially uh, get get the message out there. Um, tell Any, every farmer, uh, dairy farmer, needs to know. Yeah, download the app because what we do is we if they download the app, we ask them for some small information because the information in dairy is about two months in arrears. So we ask them for their live milk production and their fats and solids. So that lets us. F- to give better milk forecasts into the future. And that's one thing that we ask. And then also, can if gas to farmers, speak to your milk processor, speak to your farm advisors, ask them, is your milk, is your milk processor is connected to Concept Dairy? Farm advisors, is Tugas gone board? Yeah, well, we, we've spoken to him a few times, you know. They're <laughs> You've been doing a lot of work in the last couple of weeks, I can hear. <laughs> yeah. Final question, hire in a heartbeat. Who would Dermot McCulgan like to hire in a heartbeat? Okay, I'm going to be a bit cheeky here. I, there's two people. I'm That's okay. That's two right. people. I think because it's all about having a great team. And one person, the lady, is Mackenzie Scott. Um, she has absolutely decided to execute a plan on philanthropy and has dedicated billions of dollars to um, multiple charities all around the world. And she is the ex-wife of oh, Jeff Bezos. Of Jeff Bezos. I knew I knew that. I'm- and she. Absolutely. She comes from a hedge fund background, understands what we're doing, but also was the backbone behind building Amazon to what it was and supported Jeff the whole way and had four kids. That wouldn't be a bad one. Yeah. yeah. And then the other person is a, a guy who I used to work for, a guy called Bill Winters. Um, he's the ex-co-CEO uh, of the investment, JP Morgan Investment Bank in London. And he was one of the original architects of the derivative contracts years, like 30 years ago. And he made... Did you say back in my time? Is that what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he made some really good calls and he really stood, he stood up for what he, what he really believed in. And he, with this subprime stuff in the crash in 2007, he's like, I don't get this stuff. I don't understand it. I want to get out of it. And he did. Okay. And so he made good calls and then he's really working on sustainability and various initiatives in his new role. And, and so he's obviously still with us. Yeah, he's still with That's us. That's always yeah. useful as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Dermot, if there's anything else that Team GBS can do for you, for Concept Dairy, I mean, we will put it out on LinkedIn, etc. All, all, all dairy farmers, north, south, east, west, um, across Europe, into the UK, because our, our podcast goes worldwide. We will have people in South Africa that will be interested in this. We have people in Connecticut who will be interested in this. And I would say that there's one or two people in New Zealand who might be interested in this. So best of luck and um, do please come back to us when you've funded and when you've got your first farmers and your first uh, processors and your banks on board and when Dermot Desmond has given you a buzz and (laughs) all of the good stuff. Dermot McCulgan, Gurfmina Magat. Fosharoth, Gurfmina Magat. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil. The best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. That Great Business Show. Doctor, doctor, it's okay, it's okay, because we have two medical doctors in the house and uniquely, possibly, one of them is also a qualified software engineer. Dr. Declan Kelly and Dr. Luke Ward are part of the very fast-growing team at Olus Medical, whose software is a knowledge management solution. We'll find out what that means. Allowing hospitals to have a single sort of source of truth, that's their word, for their medical knowledge. Olus Medical is part of the Belfast-based Ignite NI Accelerator program. You may remember we had Stephen McPeak, founder of Civic Dollars, also of Ignite NI on episode 45. Stephen's software is a really clever way of getting the community to live better lives. And if I read right recently, Civic Dollars is about to launch just about now in Dublin. But 
Back to the Future. Let's have a chat now with Doctors Declan and Luke about raising two million pounds sterling, increasing the staff ninefold in just four months. And of course, how a doctor became a software engineer, or was it the other way around? Declan Kelly, Luke Ward, welcome to that great business show. Hi, Colin. Thanks very much for having us on. And you are the software engineer. That's right. Yeah. Did you spend seven years studying medicine and then did software engineering 10 years of your life? Uh, well, both happened simultaneously, really. Um, Are you that bright that uh, you can do both at the same time? No, no, just just very busy, I think. Did you have a life outside of uh, uh, No, I did, studying? yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think my, my my partner would maybe beg to differ, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the partner, <laughs> but I think he means the other partner. <laughs> you've, <laughs> you've only decided to jump ship now. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, I've come on board here with Declan uh, since April of this year. So I've been here full time at Oldest Medical um, for the last six months. Um, my background is in emergency medicine. Um, so we both qualified in 2015 and we've both been working in the NHS um, since then. Um, as I say I came on board in April and still do practice um, some clinical medicine as well, sort of pick up some shifts in A&E. Uh, from time see, to I've time. got a spot here. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a look at that after the show. Come, <laughs> come here, Tim. Medicine is still parts of medicine. I mean, obviously, there's nuclear medicine, but there's also paper based medicine. It's a bit nuts that in this day and age, across the world, from what I can see, that there is this. Uh, there's doctors, particularly, I think, don't want to leave dirty, filthy, dodgy paper. Don't let it. They, they don't want to let it go. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 a kind of, it's a marker of um, how much pressure the system's under as well. Currently, you know, whether it's the NHS or the or the, or the HSE, um, they're very much treading water just because uh, they're under so much pressure. And to try to innovate and change under that amount of pressure, it can be very difficult. It can be a catalyst for change, but it also can be an, an inhibitor to change as well. What would your system? What's your pitch? What would you say that your system would could and will do for them? Yeah. So. I, Having access to me- medical knowledge at the point of care is extremely important. There's a, a lot of evidence suggests that when doctors access um, evidence-based guidelines, it increases uh, the quality of care they deliver to patients, so decreases mortality and decreases morbidity for patients. But getting access to that conveniently when you're in a pressure environment can be difficult. Um, but, so- but I can look up a phone. I mean, I can look up a, a tablet. I can look up anything. That cannot be the way it is nowadays, surely to God. It, yeah, I know that, uh, and that's and, and that's what maybe I, I had thought as well before I started working, before I started into medicine as well. Uh, th- there are systems, there are plenty of systems that do manage knowledge, and one of them is paper. Uh, and then Luke will attest to this in plenty of uh, departments that we've worked in. The clinical guidelines are printed out, laminated, and stuck to the wall. And sometimes that can be convenient, but it's very inconvenient when you need to update them or access them when you're not in that uh, position. You know. Where would medical dramas be if they didn't have the clipboard walking around and uh, that they could hang off the bottom of the bed? You can't do that with a tablet, can you? Oh, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, <laughs> just looks a bit more fancy. I mean, as long as you don't drop it. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, new paper is 1980s. These are the 2020s. Yeah. What's the... Mm, what, why isn't there a bigger and quicker? Forget about COVID. Why didn't it happen five years ago or 10 years ago? I'm not sure the reason that it hasn't happened, but I know from our point of view, obviously, we've sort of we've worked in the system as well. So it's definitely one of the sort of problems that we sort of see in the system, and one thing that we're sort of trying to to tackle um, and try to improve um, to try and try and move away from from the paper. Um, I know even from our own point of view, often you're working in busy departments, um, you're looking for just say be a sheet of paper to give to a patient who's come in that you're you know has been able to be discharged. May any you know you you go to look for the sheet of paper. You can't find it. Someone used the last one. There's none in the drawer. There's none in the folder. Um, you have to go and find where it is to print one out. Um, you know, the whole thing just can be become so inefficient for something which should be such a very simple um, task. And what have you two and your team now of nine, what have you done to change the world? Well, uh, we're... Let's 
in the process of changing the world. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> so I, th- I think we're 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 standing on the shoulders of the ch- of massive changes across multiple different industries. And one one of those biggest changes is an adoption of cloud first uh, computing, uh, and that was one of the biggest limitations in healthcare historically up until the last you know five or six years. The push was very much for on premise software, so all, all of the knowledge had to be on premise and okay. in, in, the in the hospital and exactly. it went from hospital A to B. It wasn't traveling with you. Exactly, exactly. But now it lives in the air, in the cloud. That's exactly right, yeah, yeah. There are others in the in this field. There are competitors. Yep. Uh, no, there, there, there are plenty of uh, competitors. So in, what do you do differently and better? Yeah. So the, the, the biggest thing that we do is actually allow sharing of the knowledge. Um, so a lot of the competitors maybe are, are business-to-business SaaS-type models that are very siloed. They'll sell into one hospital, then they'll move to the next and then sell the same software again as the, as the B2B SaaS model is. Our model is a hybrid of a B2B SaaS and a platform model. So what we do is we, we allow hospitals to upload uh, educational content, clinical guidelines, etc. And if they're happy for them to be shared, they're then shared across the network of the entire hospital base. So, for example, we're live in, in Stanford University Hospital in California. Now, how I saw that, that is a big win. How did mm-hmm. you get in there? Um, so, that was actually via our, our advertising campaigns on Twitter. Uh, so, we got lucky with, with that one, I think. Well, you know what they say about luck? It's kind of, if you do it <laughs> right, it might not be that lucky. It's yep. just because you did it right. But, so, somebody in Stanford sees your pitch on Twitter, yep. which is going to be teeny, and exactly, they were yeah. interested and they went for you. Exactly. So, so the, the lead at uh, Stanford University uh, wanted to develop this app out further themselves. They, they had a sort of prototype that did now, small you've, you've jumped ahead there. The yeah. lead. Yes. The, Who the, is the lead? Uh, he's, he's one of the digital health leads in their department, in the emergency department. Okay. So are you specifically focused on uh, emergency medicine or is so, that... Is because, that what the real action is? Well, because our, our background is in emergency medicine, I suppose we start we started off there. So um, at the moment, we're in forty emergency departments um, across the world, be it in and it's UK, fantastic. Ireland. And when did you start? Uh, so we launched uh, the product in March twenty twenty. But you're already in forty hospitals across the world. Yes, yeah. yeah so, uh, uh, so, there's something you're doing that you're not telling me that is, there must be something really good in what you're doing. I think I think maybe there's a disbelief in how antiquated the systems are that that we're that we're trying to replace. No, is, I would believe that. I mean, yeah, look, yeah. At, I've got a pen in my hand and I've got a piece of paper in front of me. I mean, that is how it is at the moment. But I say again that this there have been other iterations of what you're doing before. You're doing something bigger or better or brighter. There's something that you're doing that people like. What is it? The so, secret sauce. Yeah. So I think I think the secret sauce really is is the fact that me and Luke have come from you know five plus years experience working on the shop floor in emergency departments, and we know you know the nooks and crannies of, of these departments. So we, therefore, we know exactly what's needed and where it's needed. So combining that within the background in software development, you're able to develop a, a very bespoke product that solves multiple problems in the in the one platform. So I think it's that insight into the, into the domain is the key. I'm smiling when you say that you've got five years of active man, uh, active work. In, on the floor because I'm going to post photographs of you and if anybody sees you they'll say have you done your A-levels or you're leaving <laughs> search yet because they, youthful would be a good yeah. word for it so that is good news but have you both chucked medicine now or no sorry uh, but um, Luke you said that you're going to s- you're well, still th- do th- a little bit on like, the side. this is very much you know Olus Medical is very much my full time gig um, yeah. but do I, I do sort of I keep up like to keep, keep up the clinical skills as well not just prepared to throw it all away you yeah. know just yet after so many years and that but uh, I, I still enjoy it and I think it's But are you going to become we won't call us a software engineer but a, a, a software entrepreneur so yeah I suppose my role at the moment at the moment is uh, pretty much reaching out to like the heads of departments and liaising with departments um, and I suppose yeah. my background gives me some, some would that be a nice word for a salesman but do medi- 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 <laughs> medi- <do> salesman <laughs> uh, I, I'm not prepared to call myself a salesman just yet <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I'm getting there if yeah. you get a sale you're a salesman <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> and therefore you want sales or a fair sales enough, person more correctly yeah. so the, the, if you're already in 40 what's the big plan or where are you have you started making money yet um, yeah, so so we're, we're generating revenue from the from the forty hospitals that that, that we're currently days. in, um, and the plan then is to expand. So what what we started with was my emergency department, and that's that's kind of how we brand the platform. But now we're expanding into all the other specialties. So my pediatrics, my intensive care, my anaesthetics, etc. Uh, and then we expand into other specialties within the hospital um, that we're already in. So that's that that's so you're only scratching the surface. 
Yeah, so we, we have a big launch coming up in November for uh, the 14 other medical, main medical specialties. So we have live my emergency department just at the minute. So we're launching these other 14. And I mentioned that you've gone from one to nine uh, employees over the last couple of months. That presumed that you've brought on board more software engineers or what else? Exactly, yeah. So the majority uh, of guys that jumped on board were, were software engineers. Uh, so we made one recent hire as well that uh, he's also a doctor. Um, so he's a, a pediatric doctor and a software engineer as well. And he applied for the software engineering job. Very uh, just, interesting. You know, so you're not the only one. I'm definitely <laughs> not. No, I'm definitely not. Yeah. The, I mean, I always hear all meds bitching about how uh, difficult the job is and all. You're the obvious way to get out of medicine but stay in medicine. Uh, there must be a queue of people in medicine who would love to come working with you, particularly if you're going to be a worldwide success. Uh, yes, yeah, I suppose it's definitely a, a, an attractive prospect um, for the, the, the common workforce, and, that, and that's something we're very interested in, in hearing from people as well. We we, we really uh, w- want to talk to people who have domain expertise, but maybe also have uh, expertise in a different discipline. And I think it's the combination of both those, whether it's healthcare expertise plus software engineering, or healthcare expertise plus sales or plus biz dev. So that that, that type of stuff I think is very powerful. And you've raised two million pounds sterling. Are you yep. telling the world who gave you that money? Um, yeah, yeah. So this is, a, I suppose this is the first announcement of it uh, as well. Uh, oh, so, uh, very nice. So you, Thank you. Be <laughs> privileged. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Big exclusive for yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> But who are they? Yeah, so the lead, <laughs> she almost forgot yeah, to tell. Yeah, almost me. forgot to tell. So, so the, the, the lead investor was uh, uh, Sam Ipada, who are uh, a Spanish uh, venture capital firm. Uh, and uh, they have been, I must say, they have been excellent to work with. Uh, the, the whole process of, of the funding raise, which can be quite stressful, was, was made very smooth by them. And where did you find or come across them? Um, I actually um, I just did a cold outreach to them. And this is a, uh, now, a topic of contention. cold outreach, that's yeah. a nice word for you. Just phone them up. Uh, well, email, but email. yeah, yeah, yeah. To so somebody um, down there. Yeah, exactly. Down so, there in Spain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So mo- mo- most venture capital firms will have some sort of way of streaming um, yes. cold, cold inputs. Uh, and I just explained who I was, what I've done to date and what I'm looking to do and, and asked for, for an email back. And that, that's what started. And from the email to the cash, how long did that take? Uh, well, I suppose from the initial emails from to all the venture capital firms uh, to the to the cash took about four and a half months, maybe. That's okay. Yeah, that's roughly average, I think. Because yeah. we had Fidelma McGurk of Payslip on, and she was raising big cash, and uh, she's on an episode. I can't remember now, maybe four or five episodes ago, and she was brilliant because she went through the process of raising cash and all how to weed out the messers. Mm. So that was your Spanish investor. Yep. Who else have you got? So we have uh, two other institutional investors, so Seven uh, Percent uh, Ventures, which are London based, uh, and uh, Ascension Ventures, um, which which are also based in England as well. And again, they've they've both been excellent and, and uh, uh, very pleasurable to work with, um, and offered some great advice along the way as well. And is that it? Now you're done. You don't need any further funding until <laughs> you sell for I don't know, hundred million or maybe a billion. <laughs> that's, yeah, or? that's that's the dream. That that precious equity, isn't it? But uh, no, I think I think we're very much uh, on the venture path now, uh, and I think. Uh, we're adopting that Silicon Valley type model, uh, which is now becoming ubiquitous across the world, uh, which is you know tra- raising every twelve to eighteen months to, to to fuel the growth, and that's we want to be in the position that the only limiting factor is more capital, and if we plug in more capital, X plus Y equals what the output we want, and that's what we're trying to prove now. And where are you HQ at the moment? Uh, Belfast. And will you ha- manage to stay there, or do you have to go to Silicon Valley to really boost yourselves? Uh, no, so so we are fully remote as as a company. So and that's something that uh, kind of I would I'm keen to keep. We do meet up uh, uh, for for uh, social events and and you know company discussions and and what and whatnot. Uh, but I I'm very uh, keen to keep it uh, an Irish company. I think this is. I've grown from the roots of uh, from Belfast and very much supported by Invest Northern Ireland and, and the Ignite team. And I think it's important then to not, once you get to a certain point, unless there's a very, very good reason for it, to just jump ship and go across the way. I think being able to grow the company from here and become a multi-billion pound company is also a great example then to other countries, companies coming up. Multi-billion, that's, that's a nice that's, uh, ambition. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, yeah. And meanwhile, Luke, you're going to be playing uh, is a guitar. What do you play? A uh, bit of guitar, mostly bazooki, which is like a... Oh, I know a, what a bazooki is. You know bazooki, is. fair enough, yeah. yeah so. When bazooki... No, what do you think? I'm not start singing just yet, Tom, maybe, yeah. 
So what's the next steps and what, how can Team GBS help and what can we do for you, introduce you to hospitals or how are you doing on hospitals on the island of Ireland? Are, you, are they opening their doors? So we're in, um, well, we're in most of the hospitals in Northern Ireland um, and we're in, uh, the only hospital in HSC is Mayo uh, University Hospital. Um, Tell me now, just as curiosity, why would Mayo take you on and others? Is it that they haven't or how, or why were they the early adopter of the HSC? So, well, I'm not sure how did Mayo come about via Twitter as well, was it? Um, um, yeah, the, the, the Mayo came about via, via Twitter as well. Um, and this is very uh, interesting. Yeah, the, Twitter, Twitter, yeah. Doris is going to love you because that's the first <laughs> positive yeah. stuff I've heard about Twitter for a long time. There, there's a big uh, med Twitter ecosystem, a med Twitter uh, universe, uh, and this is where you know the medics will maybe either to rant about stuff, tell stories, or to post educational threads as well. So there is a, a, quite a large presence uh, on Twitter in the, in the medical universe. That's interesting. Okay, I must kind of... See if I can segment all the things around podcasting. There is a big podcast community out there. So back to the uh, other then, hospitals in, in the in the Republic. So what we, can we we'd do? actually been in, in the process of of reaching out to uh, to a number of different hospitals, and actually the cyber attack sort of came then at sort of a, at, a, at a bad time for us. So that sort of put the uh, the brakes on a little yeah. bit. But uh, you know, obviously, we will be sort of continuing conversations then with other places, and uh, yeah, try and get up and running in other departments. Okay. Anything else we can do for you? Um, yeah, so I, th- I think I think getting the uh, kind of what we're trying to do out there is important. Number one and number two, trying to get the message out there of you know we are interested in talking to people that have expertise in the healthcare space. Okay. That, um, so that I think that's important. And I well. hope that both of you got your email about higher in a heartbeat. Did you get that? Uh-huh. We did, yes. We Very did. good. <laughs> because some people they make, they stop my heart and I need the <laughs> medical help because uh, they say what. And I said, no, 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 I sent it to you. Hire in a heartbeat. Yeah. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? So, so, so the, the, the answer for this is, is probably slightly generic in, in the fact that we, we've no one single person. Don't but, say Richard Branson, he's <laughs> been booked by everybody else. <laughs> no, I think, I think the, the generic answer, I think, is, is someone who's able to combine uh, expertise from multiple disciplines. I think uh, someone who has expertise within the healthcare space, they know uh, exactly how it functions, but they also have expertise either in software development, sales marketing, or business development. I think... The combining those two things is, as you said, is very rare and very hard to come by. So uh, putting the call out to, for, for something like that. Have you got a name? You're meant to have a name, you see. You're meant to say to me, Jack Smith or Mary Smith. Is there anybody that you can think of? And you've got, like, you're alive on air now. You're going to have to, I'm eyeballing you. You've yeah. got to find me a name of somebody. Yeah. Look, <laughs> dig them out. Here, <laughs> so, <quick>. emergency <laughs> department. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> no names. <laughs> no, I'm not letting you off. Tell me somebody. There, somebody yeah. who's in VC. Somebody who's in med. Uh, somebody who's that you actually just admire. Well, the, well there's a guy who's, who's a, a guy I actually used to, to work with, uh, and uh, he's he's got an excellent job at the minute at a world leading AI company. His name's Rob Brisk, uh, and he's 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 got a brilliant role where he is. Uh, but I think he would be an excellent addition to the team. He, he's got Brisk a PhD. Or- I- ISK. Okay. Yeah. So he has got a PhD in AI in medicine. He's also a senior cardiologist. Uh, so, um, I often, Im- I mean, it's not that I often, these guys who obviously spend all day, every day study, they just blow me away. Say that again, he's a cardiologist so and a PhD a, in AI as uh, well. Yes, yeah, so the application of AI in uh, in medicine. So he's a software engineer as well. Rob, we need you. He's a man on demand. <laughs> he's, a man, he's a man on demand. But yeah, but again, so he, he is a very, very good knowledge of the system and, and knows the solutions that need to be there. That was Declan Kelly and previous to that was Luke Ward. And they are part of the um, oldest medical team. Now nine. When will you be doubling that again? Or are you hiring at the moment? You are. You said you were hiring. Uh, so we're, we we're always we're not actively hiring, but if there's any very talented React native or well, React PhD web developers, AI, really who's a cardiologist <laughs> called Rob Brisk, you're hired. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thanks so much for joining us on that great business show. That great business show dot com is brought to you by De facto shaving oil, the best anyone can get, made in Ireland, sold worldwide, backing great women led businesses on every show. Regular listeners will know that Trinity College Dublin's Tangent is a centre for innovation and entrepreneurship and part of what they do is to provide short postgraduate level 9 certificate programmes for adult learners, all in the space of innovation and entrepreneurship. 
The better news is that these part-time programmes are funded by the government's Springboard initiative, so are either free or damn near free. What I didn't know, though, is that Trinity provides education nationwide, delivering classes this year in Wexford, Athlone, Galway. And this term, they have courses on healthcare innovation in partnership with their TCD School of Medicine, innovation and enterprise development, targeting emerging or existing entrepreneurs, creative and cultural entrepreneurship aimed at creative individuals who want to develop a sustainable career in the arts world. And that's going to be a challenge, I think. But anyway, to find out more, I have Gillian Roddy, Education Programme Manager at Tangent, and Mary Vahey, an independent brand designer, both in studio. Gillian and Mary, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank, Thank you so you. much. You're oh, very quiet, Gillian. <laughs> the biggest surprise for of this for me was that Trinity has left Dublin too, leafy Dublin too. It's not really leafy, actually. It's more concrete, <laughs> Dublin too. And you have opened up options or operations in Wexford, Athlone and Galway. That's, that's right. brand new to me. Yes, that's right. Uh, so in 2019, uh, under Tangent, we were the first uh, unit within Trinity to offer education courses outside Dublin. And we run our regional course, regional colloquially as we call it, but it's the Postgraduate Certificate in Innovation and Enterprise Development. Uh, in the first year, it was run in Dublin, Limerick and Galway. And now we're running it in Dublin, Athlone and Wexford. So what form would it take, say, we'll take, uh, since it's the centre, Athlone? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What form does it take in Athlone? So the courses are broadly the same across all of our regions. So it's a hybrid model. Um, we're all very familiar with what that term means now. Um, so it's it's being run as a blended hybrid model. So the very first module that students do, one of three, will be run in person. And then the subsequent modules will be run online. So it's a really lovely format because it means that the students get to do all of this really rich workshopping around innovation and creativity in the first instance at the beginning of the course. And then we move online. So not only is there the opportunity to meet the classmates within their regions, but when we move online, there's a whole new networking opportunity when students get to meet each other from the different regions. And you say part-time. How part-time is part-time? So it's it runs two it for the first module it'll be running on Fridays and Saturdays so weekends Thanks for ruining my weekend yeah. <laughs> <laughs> enhancing it wait till you see what we have on offer and then with for the online content it'll be run over two evenings a week and money wise is this costing me much I, I did say that it is uh, funded but uh, yeah, what's so- the, for the unfunded bits for the unfunded bits, so the if you're in if you're unemployed or you're eligible for 100% springboard funding, uh, the course is completely free. And if That's you're nice. in employment, you only have to pay 10% fees, which might be hundreds. No, we know we're talking around in around the 250 to 300 euro mark. That's okay. That's doable. Yeah. Now it's level nine. Yes. Talk me through the levels, because level nine is high, very high, actually. It is. That's an MA, is it? Or is that this, or is the standard higher again? It's, 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 it's essentially all postgraduate courses. So yeah. it starts off, so these are postgrad, this is a postgraduate certificate. You've also got diplomas, masters, and then PhD would be a level 10. And will 10. I get a TC, sorry, will, uh, will it be a level 10? A PhD. a PhD would be a level 10, okay. yes. So if I do this course, do I get a piece of paper from Trinity College Dublin? You absolutely do. And this is the Worth wonderful thing. 300 quid any day. Absolutely. And and this is something that we pride ourselves on in Tangent, um, that, that many of us who work there have a history of working um, around accessible education. And you know, adult learners are no different. You know, we want education and we want we want opportunity to, for, uh, to be on a learning journey to be something that Every adult, you know, feels it is something that's available to Don't them. Don't tell Joe Duffy about uh, accessibility <laughs> in Trinity. That is one of his things. And way back when he was Students' Union President, not a lot has changed. Some bits have changed, but not a lot. Absolutely. And, and we're very conscious of that, that, you know, we talk about the invisible barriers to education mm-hmm. that exist. And they are very, very real. So one of the wonderful things about the Springboard courses is that it helps to break down a number of those barriers by reducing the fees, by making it available part time, by introducing a, a blended format, and so and moving out 
and Outside moving of out of Dublin. Exactly. That so sounds good to me. Our students are fully registered students. You get a student card with a discount. You can avail of all of the same student discounts as, <laughs> as anybody else. You don't else. have to be a certain age or anything, no? No, it is, it is limitless in quite, terms quite of age. Quite sign up. I'm <laughs> telling you, it's, it's fantastic. A Tell me uh, you get a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, the t-shirts and the scarves and the hoodies are all available from the Students' Union shop no, in House yeah, okay, let's get that. <laughs> Mary, are you a disciple? I am. I have uh, just completed um, the course, just finished there middle of August. Why so. did you do that? Because you have a very interesting background. Yeah, so I'm a designer. I specialise in branding. Um, I've over 20 years experience and um, I've worked in agencies. I've worked on in-house teams. And for the last six years, I've been self-employed. Uh, which, when you said agency, I yeah. was, thought you were going to use the word aviation because you have worked, have you, in aviation? I have worked with aviation well, sorry, I companies, say you yeah. Like a, uh, Boeing or something, no. But you've worked around that area, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've worked uh, with aviation for a number of years. Um, and well, What would you do for them? Because I'm just curious. As um, I am. So. Uh, God, the world of uh, if aviation requires a huge amount of branded elements. I mean, everything from delivery on the aircraft itself, from uh, cabin. And you would actually design that? So uh, I, I have to have full disclosure here. So I would have, one of uh, my biggest clients uh, would be Aer Lingus and um, have worked. They're good, they're look, nice. Yeah. Look, it's very lucky, know them. Yeah. very lucky to have worked with them probably going on eight or ten years now. So kind of came from the agency and then worked with them independently. Um, with Are you old enough to remember when Mrs. Thatcher put her handkerchief over the brand new livery designed for British Airways? It was a dog's dinner of a design. But I have no great uh, gras for Mrs. Uh, uh, T, but she did the right thing. She, there was an exhibition and they had a mock model or something. And she went over with her hanky and put it over and said, you know, kind of take that out of my sight. You don't remember that? I don't remember. That should have been taught in your <laughs> module, I'll tell you, because that was a lesson to get it right. And don't upset the Prime Minister. Um, so, yeah, about two years ago, the company was, the airline was rebranded. Um, it was the, the main design of the, the branding was done by a company um, called Lipicot in the UK. And then um, myself and an associate designer, then we worked on the huge kind of task of the implementation rollout of the branding across all of the elements with obviously a massive team in Aer Lingus and the marketing and team And what would that mean? Well. I mean, I know nothing about how you implement if, a rebrand. Oh, it was like a uh, six month top secret project. We worked in a locked office off-site from anywhere. Um, we even had, you know, masked out windows. I'm sure our neighbours in the offices next door were wondering what on drones, earth we were doing. <laughs> um, you know, we would have... So you are the James Bond of design. Oh, well, I'm a small part of a huge team that was involved in it. But going through it, like you, so you get your, whatever the new brand or brand look is, and then that has to be applied to the back of every seat, is it? Or to so every piece I'm, of paper? Everything from the minute you walk into an airport, well, even beforehand. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't have done the digital side of things in terms of they have a whole team, digital team on the, the website and all that kind of thing. But the physical elements, so you walk into the airport, everything from every sign you see, the desk fronts, um, the, uh, the actual back walls, the branding, all the way along through go on to the boarding gates, everything you see on board, menus. It is interesting when you say it. Not everybody thinks that somebody had to create that. <laughs> yeah. And yet you're probably walking through every airport saying, oh God, that's very interesting. I wonder who created that. I wonder who created that. And, uh, it's, and it's not even one. It's So basically you can imagine you've got embroidery, you have got uh, you know, paint uh, materials, you have got vinyls for signage, you have digital colours for airport screens, you have um, printed, um, you have printed fabrics as well as printed materials. You might have, you know, the weave on the, the uh, cue poles, you know, with the branding on them oh, that's pulled yeah, out. Yeah. So, like, we had to see samples of everything to make sure that the colour matched as, okay. as for the guidelines. So. We better go back to yeah. talking about Trinity. What did Trinity do? So. For, oh, no, no, I find this really interesting. A lot of my family are in graphic design, so um, 
Oh, you may have even worked with them. We'll discuss that off air. Um, the Trinity thing. What, what did Trinity, this, yeah, so, uh, the program, teach you or help you with? Yeah, well, even realistically, 2020 obviously was the year that everyone <laughs> will never forget. So yeah. um, it had a big I impact, wish to forget. obviously, <laughs> sure, um, on work. So therefore, you know, it meant that I had a lot more time to look around for options to see, well, what else could I do? And, you know, also to challenge gosh, should I be thinking about alternative, in, uh, you know, revenue streams or income streams as well? You know, it's a great time to step back. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like everything you you don't uh, expect it. But when you do, you you think, what can I do positively with this uh, particular situation? So um, the tangent course was, it was on my radar for a few years, to be honest with you. And Why, where had you seen it? Because um, we, we weren't mine, up and running then. So mm-hmm. obviously you'd only hear about it in the podcast now. Oh, yes. All, all, <laughs> it'll be all over now. It'll be... <laughs> Uh, but uh, a friend of mine actually had completed the course a few years ago. Um, I was really impressed by um, her new levels of confidence and her just her um, can do attitude and action orientated um, attitude to just go and try things and be brave. And that really that really inspired me. And I thought, mm. so it, it always intrigued me, but I guess timing and situations were never kind of right until. So you have done it now. And Mm -hmm. are you now a new Mary Vahey? Oh, transformed. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Elements are are different, certainly. You you can't do a course like that and and come out of it. Has it changed you in business? Oh, absolutely. Really? Such as? Well, um, I think that I am a better researcher, better understanding of my clients, their customers really kind of um, hone in on the real reason for doing a project. Why is it? You know, why Why now? Who is it for? What's, what do you want to say to them? What's the intended reaction from this particular piece? You know, so, you can get fired in the business if you ask why now. <laughs> 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 because they might think you're being cheeky. <laughs> Yeah, so it definitely that and um, the the uh, whole. I think I, I realized just how much time I can carve out for myself when I am one hundred and ten percent focused uh, with okay. working like, like and studying, that, yeah. Yeah. and you know you really carve out every single second you have available to use. That is some testimonial, Julian. It is, it is, and and I'm going to fly the flag a little bit higher and say that it's it's not unusual at the same time, that it's it's something that we really pride ourselves on. The, the word transformative would be used quite often. And I think this is what the fascinating thing is about the areas of innovation and entrepreneurship, that very often when we, when we think about education, we think about sitting in a classroom and having a lecture and you open a book and you become a historian or you learn how to do maths and you're learning a topic, you're acquiring knowledge. But when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship, really what we're talking about is shifting your mindset. So it's a very holistic approach to learning something new. And an awful lot of what we do around uh, learning these types of skills is around, and I don't like this phrase, but these soft skills, I think that's such a misnomer because when we talk about soft skills, really what we're talking about is all those fundamental skills that you're required to excel at in order to to be a success or even to just, you know, not even to be a success, but to be passable these days. So who and how many are you now looking for? So we have, uh, well, there's a number of different, we, we have about 400 places open across all of our courses across the academic for, year. For the academic year, yes. fine. And the academic year has just started? Exactly, exactly. So I we have you, our... It's lovely to walk around town and see young people it particularly. Is. I was walking by College of Surgeons and they were all in. And yep. somebody else was telling me yesterday that Grange Gorman is buzzing. Yes, yeah, oh, I spent a lot of time on campus, you know, even during lockdown because of the nature of what I do and and it was it was so eerily quiet. Mm. You know, it's it's a university yeah. campus. It it deserves to have life thriving in it. Now, the foxes on campus did have a great time. <laughs> They're doing brilliantly. We have we had uh, there was there is a there's a vixen. Foxes are vermin. That's all you need to know. Well, no, it was <laughs> Sam the fox. She had five fox cubs and they're thriving. The last I heard, they were having a feast on all of the the baby seagulls. 
This is the lovely thing about a podcast. I can talk about anything I want. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're here to talk about yes. business. You have 400 places. Uh, how many of them are fill, full at the moment? Or are you recruiting at the moment? Or We're actively recruiting for a number of different courses. So two of the courses have closed out. So we have a daytime course, um, Creative Thinking, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. That's closed off. And the first of our two healthcare innovation courses has closed off. But we are actively recruiting now for create um, uh, creative and cultural entrepreneurship. We're recruiting for innovation and enterprise development and we're recruiting for the second cohort of healthcare innovation. And for people, and there will be many who have not uh, gone yeah. through the doors of a university or maybe any kind of a third level education yes. system, um, if you're going for no, uh, uh, level nine, is that does that just immediately disbar them? or Absolutely not. No, I, again, part of that emphasis on uh, removing invisible barriers means making education accessible even to those people who may not have been at third level before. So there is a prerequisite for a level eight, but that doesn't disclude people who don't have it because we do open so our doors. So there isn't really a uh, necessity for it. There's, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, yeah, it, it's one of those funny ones. We do say that in order to apply that there's, you, a level eight is required. However, there if is. If you've been in business for a while, I presume that gives you. We do have, so we do, rec- it's recognition of prior learning or RPL. Mm. And so you can make an application under RPL grounds and we will assess those as well. And we strongly encourage anybody who really thinks that this is for them and but isn't sure to get in touch with us because we can talk you through that process. Because like I said, this is very different. Amory will be able to testify to this. It's it's as much about what every individual student is bringing to the table. It's a two-way education process. And are you recruiting people in your three other centres, Wexford, yes. Athlone and Galway? Are they full or not? No, we still have some places available. So we'd love to hear from people who are who are based within those regions or around those regions because they'll have all this incredible local knowledge that we want to learn from them. Like I said, it's two ways all the time. So I'm going to take Athlone again. So yes. I sign up in Athlone. and. Yes. When will I graduate? <laughs> this is this is one of the big questions. You know, do I get my piece of paper and do I graduate? And the answer to both of those is yes, a resounding yes. So you, you're you, fun- you probably don't know this, but I'm a cynical so and so, and I know that if you do a ten week course, it has to be ten weeks or more in Harvard. You can call yourself a Harvard alum, <laughs> and they charge you twenty five thousand or thirty five thousand just for that. So I'm going to start, I've got a thought of a little business here. I'm going to start mocking up TCD graduate diplomas and selling them on the side of the street. How about that? Well, I think that's definitely a conversation that we need to bring offline. Um, no, all of our, our, our courses are all, all of our students are fully registered. Um, and when you f- complete your course, successfully complete your course, you go through a full graduation ceremony and oh, it goes cool. through. Oh, it is. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'd be wonderful. I can throw my hat and my mortarboard and then scan the, Abs- uh, anyway, Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really and good how fun. Long, sorry, go back to yep. Athlone. Because yes. I, I, you know, I'm a terrible person for going off on little tangents. <laughs> Athlone, how long does it last? All of our courses are in or around 20 weeks. Uh, stuck so, to, to 20 weeks stuck together, as in not yes. 10 weeks now and five weeks and then another five weeks and another year or something like that, no? No, we do have restrictions within the academic calendar. So okay. if you start in January, you'll normally finish around June or the end of June or beginning of July. And you are recruiting now for January? Yes, we okay. are indeed, yes. That's yes. all right. Yeah. There's no reason why anybody shouldn't at least have the con- should not have the conversation with you. Absolutely. And Mary, you obviously give it two or three thumbs up if you had the third thumbs up, would you? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Just to follow on, actually, from Gillian's point there, I did not have a level eight. Okay, so it's good. It's worth to say that. Listen to this. <laughs> ah, Mary. <laughs> So I applied under the RPL. So absolutely go for it. Are you like for you know, people who have 15, 20 years experience, they yeah. have a world of knowledge and, um, you know, lots to offer. And tell me then, she's not listening. Was the process <laughs> of the application process difficult, long winded? No, not at all. Um, really clear um, what you needed to, probably about five different things that you need to, to um, gather and to submit. Um, there were one or two things that I had some questions on. I sent them in and um, got responses really quickly. So no, it was very, um, very easy and straightforward. To be and honest. did you get your diploma? I um so certificate so certificate, um, graduation is hopefully fingers crossed in January. Hopefully. Mortarboard no. 
<laughs> yeah, oh, definitely. God, yeah, get the glad rads on. <laughs> <laughs> At last. <laughs> yes. Great. Okay, listen, Gillian, yes. final uh, question. Actually, I have to ask you a final question. Question, But um, closing time, when, when do you need uh, these applications in? Within the next couple of weeks. The the closing dates are in around mid-October, depending on which course it is. But okay. all of the details are on our website. But ASAP if you want to be top of the queue, basically. Yeah. Yes. Or even what we encourage people to do is start your application through the Springboard portal because once you start it, we can see it. Okay. And then we can get in touch with you if there's any problems. So even if it's just to throw in a piece of paper. So Google what? Tangent TCD. Okay. Mary, do you want to say? I was just going to add to that. It's a really good point because um, if you have to go back to your original educational institute to get a paper copy, or if you don't have it mm. one to hand, I um, said my ones are shut you know, down, right? so, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you might need a few weeks for that. So definitely worth start starting early. Okay, now if both of you were very good, and if you were uh, paying attention in class, you were told to tell me higher in a heartbeat. Did you see that on the email? No, neither of you have read your email. So you're meant to tell me somebody that you would hire in a heartbeat. So I'm going to make you, just off the top of your head, somebody that you would just so love to have on your team. The only person you're not allowed to choose is Richard Branson because everybody says Richard Branson. Somebody did say Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I explained that she's no longer with us. So she's not, it doesn't have to be alive or dead. Who wants to take that one? Barry, you look like you actually know somebody. Somebody in, in design that you would just say... Coco Chanel, somebody like that, just like, oh, God, if only. Who's your go-to favourite? Somebody who's... I think someone like John Rusher or someone, he's just really kind of pure in terms of yeah. design principles or that. I'd love to really, yeah, he'd be amazing to work with. And his kids are all gone into the same business now, mm, I see. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's a good choice. John Rusher. You're not getting away with this, Gillian. You've <laughs> got to come up with somebody. You better think of some uh, Trinity alum that uh, you think... Is it was Goldsmith Oliver Goldsmith? Was he a Trinity? Um, alum? He was, but I, I, it does it have to be? A, can I go with somebody adjacent go to, 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 to Trinity? So I'll, I'll go with uh, um, Attenborough. David Attenborough. So David Attenborough. Um, genuinely one of the true innovators of his time. You know, he started out uh, working in the BBC and essentially created jobs for himself as yeah. he went along. An incredible pa- a man and an and incredible And if he did story. nothing else, I'd sit him in a chair and I'd just say, talk away there. Oh, absolutely. I'd listen absolutely. to his voice all day, any day, every day. For sure. Oh, yeah. You see, that was not difficult, was it? <laughs> just like the courses in Trinity here. Uh, they're, they're, uh, we won't go there. <laughs> I could start and go off. Anyways, that is it from That Great Business Show. I should have said thank you very much to Gillian Roddy and to Mary Vahey for joining us on That Great Business Show. And that is it from The Great Business Show. Episode 55, learning all about these great businesses in person was sound engineer Rob Curry. And later on in Dublin Podcast Studios manager, he be Peter Rice, will be checking our homework remotely. Mina Buchos to you both. My thanks to Oina Phelan and Hazel Davis at True TCD for helping line up this tangent item. Team GBS wants to make more podcasts like the ones we make for the Love Irish Food brand. So if you'd like our team to deliver world-class podcasts for you, do please get in touch. And we also want your ads. If you want to talk to Ireland's SME community, that great business show is the way to do it. And if you know of great businesses that should be featured on Ireland's Best Business Podcast, please do not hesitate. Tell us all about it via our website or better still, LinkedIn. We are now tipping, I think last week I said we were heading for a thousand. I checked before coming on, just shy of a thousand on our LinkedIn page. We have great conversations there and I try to respond to anybody and everybody who uh, contacts us. Finally, my thanks to our sponsor, DeFactoShave.com. It is the world's best shaving oil, bar none. As I always say, try it for just one week and like me, you will be a forever convert. So from me, Conal O'Moran, until the next time, Slán t